Uh, first of all, I, I, I would like to thank the Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies for this opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts on, on slavery. Um, I, I would like especially to thank Nabojit for remembering me, remembering me after our brief uh, meeting last year at the conference on this topic. Uh, and I would also like to thank Jan for the availability that he has shown over the last few months in the process of you know, preparing this lecture. I'm going to share with you the PowerPoint. So uh, I would like to provide you some context before starting the lecture itself. Uh, I'm more or less in the middle of my PhD research in economic sociology uh, with just under two years to go. So my research is fundamentally theoretical and focuses on the eternal theme of the relation between slavery and capitalism. So the empirical and historiographic material uh, I am using is provided by an immense secondary bibli bibliography on this topic. So my research was mainly motivated by two reasons. On the one hand, uh, by the emergence and expansion in the last decades of various forms of unfree labor, uh, by the rise of a dominant discourse that seeks to classify them as modern slavery, uh, and the controversies generated around this problem. On the other hand, by the renewed academic interest in the historical relation between capitalism and slavery, uh, especially in what, in what has been called new history of capitalism. This is a line of research that started on the US, which, which has ramifications in the Netherlands and Brazil. However, these debates had taken in parallel and with very few connections between them. So you don't have connections between these type of authors, or rarely. Uh, the field of new history of capitalism rarely extends beyond the 19th century and only suggests, suggests some relations with the phenomenon of, of modern slavery. The difficulty of this field in presenting clear concepts is also notorious. The term capitalism is often used without any definition, uh, and some authors explicitly refuse to present anything that resembles a definition. Uh, in this respect, the clarity and theoretical quality seems to me uh, inferior to the debates on the 1970s. Uh, I'm also not very uh, satisfied with the theoretical categories that we find in the debate on modern slavery. The most controversial aspect there has been the use of the term slavery, a problem in itself quite complex, but my dissatisfaction is mainly with the little space that is given to explanations about the cause of the phenomenon. Uh, in general, I think today we are facing two parallel debates on the problem of slavery in modern times, and with a common blind spot of a categorical reflection on its relationship with the capitalist social form and its historical trajectory that can give some theoretical consistency to the increasingly vast empirical data that we have. Uh, my research does seeks to determine the categories and categorical relations that can allow us to better understand the real transformations of slavery in modern capitalist society and to carry out a systematic critical respective of, sl of slavery between the 15th century and today. Uh, it, it, is, it is therefore a theoretical thesis reflecting on an empirical material in long durée. From a theoretical point of view, I think that the Marxian project of critique of political economy continues to provide us with important categories, and I'm particularly interested in how the so-called critique of value, especially the authors Moish Postone and Robert Kurtz, renewed the critical and historical specific character of Marx categories. Although an important part of my research is also about the historicity of the category of slavery itself in the context of modernization, what I'll present to you today is primarily a small part of what I consider to be the fundamental aspects of the approach to the problem of the relationship between capitalism, slavery, and unfree labor. And second, an outline of what I plan to become one of the final chapters of the doctoral thesis. So in the last two decades, the problematic classification of a vast number of very different phenomena as modern slavery has been generalized. So controversies have been mostly centered on the legitimacy and effects of the use of the term sl slavery. In these controversies, it's, it's extremely common to see jumps from extremely uncertain global statistical estimates uh, regarding the number of modern slaves, considering that these are illegal activities, uh, and jumps to biographical reports and photo sessions about individual modern slaves 
invariably treated on the first name basis. So it's a strange leap that they, they, it's happening. What is disturbing to me is that faced with so different and complex phenomena, the main question has not been what is exactly is this and how did it came to be, uh, but rather is this real slavery or not? So the answer has been sought through analogies and comparisons with historical slavery, almost always with transatlantic slavery, often isolating phenomena from their specific historical context where they acquire their full meaning. So the discussion has given rise to some important clarifications, but legal aspects have occupied more and more space. So I, I do not think that we are much closer to realizing what is really happening, as long as it's given so little space for explanations of the structural causes of the different phenomena, considering the current social totality of global capital. Christina Canzapunta, this is a chief of the Global Report on Trafficking in Persons of 2016 from the UN, said in a Guardian interview that she does not think there is any real comprehension of what we are facing. So if someone in this position admits this, then I think that we really got a serious problem. So while the dominant discourse refers to exponential demographic growth, globalization and government corruption, uh, its critics highlight the consequences of neoliberalism, poverty and restrictive immigration policies. Now, these explanations are not simply wrong. I believe they contain moments of truth, but in, in my view, they are too vague or superficial and fail to capture the essence of the global phenomenon. I think that these explanations need to be framed by an understanding of what Postone called historical trajectory of capitalism as a social form. Now, whether explicitly or implicitly, with a greater or a lesser conceptual basis, approaches to the so-called modern slavery look at the various phenomena from a, con a concept of capitalism and with a particular historical framework. There is, they have some understanding of what capitalism is an historical phase in which we are today from which they envisage modern slavery and, and, and unfree labor. So what are these historical frameworks? So we must bear in mind that there are overlaps and it, it's obvious that some authors sometimes make use of more than one of the possible frameworks. The idea that the phenomena of modern slavery are a pre-capitalist or a feudal reminiscence, although it seems to be the dominant historical framework in modern collective consciousness, especially in, in the media, is not dominant in academic research, although it may occur more or less ambiguous, especially in the dominant discourse on modern slavery. In the critics of the discourse of modern slavery, the use of the term capitalism is much more frequent, but it appears to be more rhetorical than categorical, with much more explanatory emphasis placed on neoliberal policies. So at times, modern slavery is more adequately presented as something internal to capitalism, and criticize the ideological character of neo-abolitionism. This position is more or less in line with studies of unfree labor that argue that the various phenomena are exemplary instances of fully functional capitalism. On the other hand, these positions contrast with those that argue that we are facing moments of an ongoing primitive accumulation, which however also uh, evoke neoliberal policies for, it, for its framework. So what seems to me generally excluded from all these approaches is that modern slavery and the contemporary forms of unfree labor are an expression of a fundamental and irremediable crisis of capitalism itself. So a symptom of its collapse and not of its immaturity or political orientation. So if I had to say what is the main purpose of this lecture is, then it's undoubtedly to argue that the historical and conceptual framework with the greatest potential for explanation is that of the collapse of capitalism. So the collapse is not an overnight event. So it's a process of several decades and as a result of the development of the fundamental contradiction of capitalism identified by Marx. So to understand this, first of all, we must remember that Marx's theory of value is not the theory of wealth in general. So it's a, th a theory of a particular form of wealth, socially and historically specific to capitalism that is value. So the difference between wealth and value is one of the fundamental distin distinctions made by, by Marx and it yet is it, it's, its importance is rarely noticed, even by Marxists. So wealth is a general and indeterminate notion. So it's not possible to have a theory of wealth in general as economics strongly believes. So wealth exists only within a specific social forms. So Marx refers, for example, that in antiquity, 
Wealth does not appear as the aim of production. The question is how to create the best citizen. So land and slaves are here the most relevant forms of wealth, much more than money, which is also something very different from our modern money. So this understanding underlies Aristotle's idea that if looms were to weave by themselves, masters would not need slaves. So those who study pre-modern slavery, for example, are familiar with the historical fact that European medieval wealth is dominated by land ownership while on the African continent is wealth in people or rights in persons. So uh, Joseph Miller also talked about the way in which wealth in money, which developed in, in Europe at the beginning of the modern era, was confronted with wealth in people in Africa, ultimately generating a dynamics of slave trade that has never been seen before. So approaches like these point to the social charity of all wealth and the poor abstractions of economics. So Marx repeatedly mentions the difference between real wealth or material wealth on the one hand and value or abstract wealth on the other. But it's not a matter of opposing material wealth as if it were an anthropological constant to wealth in value as a variable social form. But material wealth also exists only in certain social forms. Therefore, we should not talk about wealth in general, but about the social form of wealth. So in this sense, when Marx establishes the difference between use value and value, he points to the contradictory nature of social wealth within capitalist formation and not to an eternal concept of wealth that is extrinsically, you know, outside, related to the social form of capital. This also means that use value is a specific social category of capitalism and not a transhistorical category. So use value is the form that material wealth takes within capitalist society, dominated by the abstract form of wealth that is value. So this is the longest quote I have. It's probably the best, the, the most important to understand what I do, the theoretical framework that I'm working with. So the dialectic between material wealth and value is the fundamental contradiction of the capitalist social form. So perhaps the simplest formulation of this is found in book one of Capital. In itself, an increase in the quantity of use value constitutes an increase in material wealth. So two coats will clothe two men, one coat will only clothe one man. So nevertheless, an increase in the amount of material wealth may correspond to a simultaneous fall in the magnitude of its value. So this contradictory movement arises, arises of the twofold character of labor. The same labor performed for the same length of time always yields the same amount of value, independently of any variations in productivity but it provides different quantities of use value during equal periods of time. More if productivity rises, fewer if it falls. For this reason, the same change in productivity, which increases the fruitfulness of labor, and therefore the amount of use values produced by it, also brings about a reduction in the value of, its, of this increased total amount. If it gets down the total amount of labor time necessary to produce that use value. So I would like to highlight three things here. First, the fact that Marx shows us that the growth in material wealth due to increasing productivity does not correspond to a growth in value. Second, the importance given to time. And finally, the twofold character of labor they mentioned. So Marx's reflection is placed at the level of a society as a whole, and not from the point of view of accounting for an individual company. So since value is an abstract wealth whose magnitude is measured in labor time, the increase in material output in, e in each economic cycle does not correspond to a concomitant increase in value production. So through competition, capital becomes a contradictory process of what he calls a valorization of value that implies a very particular historical and geographical trajectory. A growing material productivity in smaller and smaller units of time and the corresponding need for market expansion. In other words, the valorization of value that Marx talks is a dynamic and objective social process of increasing temporal intensity in terms of productivity and progressive geographical constitution of a global market. What we must therefore consider is that there, both in material terms in the absolute number of products and in terms of the uh, uh, technical and scientific knowledge. But this ever-increasing material and scientific wealth does not correspond to concomitant rise in value. So this process imprints in modernity an internal 
socially objective and unconscious dynamics that it is completely unknown in pre-modern societies. So let us now look at the twofold character of labor. So Marx refers here to the fact that labor has two sides. On the one hand, concrete labor, which refers to the concrete and sensitive acts in the production of commodities. This is the side that produces material wealth. On the other hand, what he called abstract labor, that is the process of combustion of human energy, essentially the expenditure of human brain, nerves, muscles, and sense organs, which is the true source of abstract wealth of value. But it's not difficult to see that labor is itself already an abstraction. It groups a set of concrete human activities under the same category, regardless of their content, and leaves others out. So this is a, already an abstraction. In this sense, the abstraction labor is already problematic, something that Marx did not fail to recognize. So in a long reflection in the Grundrisse, for example, Marx asserts that labor is as modern a category as are the relations which create this simple abstraction. And that this simple abstraction, which modern economics places at the head of its discussions, in which expresses an immeasurably ancient relation value in all forms of society, nevertheless achieves practical truth as an abstraction only as a category of the most modern society. So what Marx shows here, still in an ambiguous way, is that modern society is, as Hannah Arendt later puts it, a labor society. So various historical, sociological, anthropological investigations over the last decades have begun to question the very category of labor highlighting in, in particular the absence of any truly equivalent category in pre-modern societies. And, and recently, a set of authors generally recognized by the, name, by the label New Critique of Value began to deepen the categories of Marx's critique of political economy from this negative and historically specific understanding of the categories value and labor. From this perspective, we cannot make critique of capitalism from the standpoint of labor, labor itself must be the object of critique. So although capitalism does not develop in a structural, homogenous, or geographically uniform way, but rather with discontinuous leaps over several centuries, this does not any, in any way mean that there is no essential and specific structural principle of the capitalist social form. So Marx leaves no doubt the historical constitution of capitalism is the historical constitution of a world system of abstract labor associated with the universalization of value as a form of abstract wealth. So for Marx, the historically, the historically predictable result of this capitalist dynamic would be a growing contradiction between the importance of science and general social knowledge applied in material wealth and a social form of abstract wealth founded on the, on the, in the undifferentiated combustion of human energy. So labor and value become uh, increasingly anachronistic social forms, while making possible a form of social wealth based on free time. So meanwhile, this context, which is ours, will be marked by an explosive social situation. And Marx uses the expression life and death situation as a, as a result of capitalism fundamental contra contradiction pointed by Marx in the Grundrisse. So this is important. Capital itself is the moving contradiction, in that it presses the, to reduce labor time to a minimum, while it posits labor time on the other side as the sole measure and source of wealth." End of quote. So it seems clear that this moving contradiction cannot continue forever. And it's in this context of this argument that Marx refers to the breakdown of capitalism. So the general theoretical framework, and from our current historical position, allows us to perceive a little better the historical trajectory of capitalism. So following Robert Kurz here, I believe that we have to consider the, tra the tra trajectory as a historical process that develops in three phases. So first, the constitution of capitalism, which is sometimes also called primitive or original accumulation of capital, in which extends from the 15th or 16th century to the middle of the 19th century. Then we have the capitalism that already established, or uh, as Marx sometimes said, that already runs on its own foundation. When Marx wrote capital, a part of Europe was already at this stage. But perhaps 20th century Fordism is the clearest paradigm of this logic. And finally, we have the new context of decomposition of capitalism due to, due to the acceleration of the moving contradiction. Now, for the current explanations of the so-called modern slavery, which ignored the moving contradiction, 
the collapse of capitalism does not even exist. So not even as a logical possibility. In this sense, the explanations are tied to the mechanisms and phenomenon of the other two phases. Either they tend to see the historical trajectory as an eternally upward movement of primitive accumulation that lasts until today, or they assume that there is nothing new in the phenomenon of modern slavery that cannot be framed by a fully functional capitalism or explained in terms of neoliberal policies. So for the former, capitalism has no imminent contradiction and can be extended indefinitely through progressive commodification. For the later, capitalism is a simple arena of political struggle and an eternal back and forth of victories and defeats. So both fail to recognize the evidences of an ever upward development of the productive forces driven by the generalization of capitalism comp competition and its significance for the reproduction of capital and the increase of surplus populations on a world scale. So basically, they find it difficult to see the essential logic underlying the empirical phenomena of the recent history of capitalism. So the long process of constitution of capitalism did not occur in a structural or geographically uniform way, but with continuous jumps over several centuries which in theory of history is also, also often conceptualized as historical non-simultaneity. So the capitalist historical process has the, has the world market as its presupposition and bearer of totality, as Marx said. So the, the, the whole world is its stage. But its empirical historical development has meanwhile unevenly affected countries and regions, which can thus present both internal and external historical non-simultaneities. We must therefore consider here the, concept, the context of the global social whole without forgetting that numerous hybrid situations occur throughout the process. So if on the one hand, modernization does not advance across all spheres simultaneously, on the other, pre-capitalist forms of social re reproduction can be abruptly eradicated or slowly decay and disappear, but also be reconfigured or entirely reinvented and gain new impetus with modernization without appearing to have any incompatibility with capitalism. So being slavery, one of those cases. So various aspects of pre-capitalist societies were thus extended within the process of historical constitution. Similarly, several specific mechanisms of the constitution process taken in isolation can continue to be seen in a capitalism that runs on its own foundations. But in this case, already within the moving contradiction therefore having a completely different historical logic and frame. In this sense, it's not necessary that the last peasant was expropriated and forced to become a wage earner to be able to say that the process of constitution of capitalism is over. And finally, considering that the collapse of capitalism lasts several decades, at first glance, several aspects of a functional capitalism continue to occur. But a deeper analysis may show that the reproduction of capital has already started to fall apart. These issues become relevant when you look at the role of the, uh, the, role of the so called extra economic violence in capitalist daily life. So it's undeniable that the fact that the so called primitive accumulation took place through extremely violent social processes, often conducted or tolerated by the state apparatus both in the peripheral and central countries, both in colonial and independence contexts. But it cannot be concluded that whenever violent processes occur, with or without the involvement of the state, we are unmistakably facing forms of primitive accumulation. This is a frequent, if not explicit, at least implicit short circuit. So violence is a moment of primitive accumulation. It's not primitive accumulation that is a moment of a general violence in an abstract way. So the process of entirely different from what happened in Europe centuries earlier during the constitution process. It is because of the capitalism already constituted in Europe that the primitive accumulation in the South has a very different concept of modernization. So it is necessary to consider the mediation of forms of violence with the different historical stages of the process of the development of global capital. So the forms of direct coercion in the process of constitution of capitalism are different from the forms of coercion that exist in a capitalism that runs on its own foundations. And for the same reason, they are both different from, our, from the forms of violence that occur in the process of the decomposition of capitalism. So whoever only focuses on the immediacy of the phenomena of violence and ignores its essence 
so it's forced to see, it's forced to see in them the mere continuation of the stages of the past. So I think these ways of thinking stem from a wrong and somewhat moralistic understanding of the relation between violence and the reproduction of capital. While it's obvious that capitalism develops accompanied by numerous forms of violence and suffering, from the point of view of the reproduction of capital as a whole, there is no immediate relation between violence and the creation and realization of surplus value. So no direct relationship between increasing suffering and growing abstract wealth. So above all, it's important to look at the decomposition phase of capitalism, but its novelties are better understood if we make a brief retrospective of the determinations of the previous phases and clarify some misunderstandings. So the so-called original accumulation of capital was not simply the increase and in concentration of capital as a previously, a previously existing thing, so, but rather the very process of its constitution as a form of social wealth historically new. So what is involved in categorical terms is the constitution of capitalism is the historical process of the transformation of money into capital. So we know that money existed before capitalism, but by no means can its, can its social function be considered the same as in capitalism. So in pre-modern societies, money had a religious function or one that mediated relations of reciprocity and personal obligation. There is gifts, counter gifts, offerings, sacrifices, etc. So themselves also markedly religious. In the long process of constitution of capitalism, money lost all of its religious threats and became autonomous as a fetish and purpose of all social production, that is capital, so value that valorizes itself. So the constitution of capital is therefore a transformation of the social function of money accompanied by its generalization and accumulation. It's the, it's the two things at the same time. So Robert Kurz showed that wealth spending on the so-called military revolution and the establishment of the fiscal military state in Europe were the, were the turning point in changing the social function of money. It was this very violent historical process that truly brought to the world the abstract activity we now call labor, a social abstraction of human energy that is channeled into the production of commodities. In this sense, transatlantic slavery, for example, was indeed an important part of what has been now called the labor problem of modernization. So, but this labor problem was not simply that of the social organization of the supply and demand of something already existing but rather that of the very historical constitution of labor as a fundamental category of modern socialization itself. So this takeoff phase of the world system of abstract labor was based on a violent logic of constitution of labor and mobilization of labor power, provoking tremendous social transformations in the old world, guiding the expansion through the West uh, New World, uh, the development of the modern colonial system and the new phenomenon of massive course migrations. So there is slaves, indentured servants, convicts, coolies, etc. So this was a long and wide historical vortex reaching the world from, from one end to the other, uh, but it had Europe as its center. So many events participated in this process, but with the generalization of monetary relations in Europe through the development of fiscal military states, and with the widespread implementation of wage labor in Europe, the process of constitution of capitalism was moving towards its end. It was for this reason that in Europe, capitalism started to run on its own foundations. But these foundations had connections with various points in the rest of the world. So such a process cannot therefore be truly understood in isolation, for example, from the gigantic amount of gold and silver channeled from Africa and especially from the Americas, stimulating the construction of the monetary economy in Europe, or the long and barbaric development of slave production in the whole Atlantic. What happened is that in Europe there is a link between labor and money, that is between abstract labor and abstract wealth, which was different from what happened in, in other parts of the planet and simultaneously needed them. So in these regions, the existing forms of money had not become autonomous as a presupposition and result of production, nor was labor and activity separated from the rest of social reproduction, although they already suffered the consequences of this, depending on what was happening in Europe at the same time. So it's because of this new link between money and labor that Marx distinguishes wage labor. <clears throat> 
And only when and where this link is socially generalized can we speak of capitalism that runs on its own foundation. So Marx does not favor wage labor because it is a, a European origin or a more civilized form of labor or based on contract. He expressly says that wage labor remains forced labor. The key issue is this. There is no capitalism without wage labor, but not all labor in the world capitalist system necessarily has to be wage labor. So state organized direct coercion was sufficient for the introduction of a social system entirely based on labor. It could only be socially universalized if workers had money too. And so they also had to have property, so their bodies. So self-ownership, the idea that humans are natural private owners of their own bodies, was the resulting category. So what is extremely important to have in mind is that workers themselves are not a commodity, as a slave is. So they are owners of one single and new abstract commodity, which is also the only one that creates surplus value, that is labor power. Now, labor power is a concept that we today immediately associate with Marx, but in fact was originally advanced during his time by, by the theory of thermodynamics, with the aim of studying the conservation of energy in all material bodies. So this origin is not accidental. From the point of view of the relation of capital, the commodity sold by a worker is neither his body nor the, prod the product of his labor, but is pure potential of expenditure of human brains, nerves, and muscles. His potential abstract labor, which is the very social substance of value. So capitalism does not directly devour the body of human beings, but instead it's energy and is therefore a social system based on fatigue, the pure expenditure of human energy in the commodity production. So therefore, it's not human body itself which takes the commodity form, but only the combustion of abstract energy contained therein. So nevertheless, given, then the, given that the expenditure of human energy can only happen through a concrete body, the corresponding paradoxical and metaphysical clarity of the commodity labor power proved to be a continual source of misunderstandings. So the endless discussions about whether the wage earner sells or rents his body are meaningless because what he sells is the right to use his body energy. In the context, self-ownership played an important role in the legal abolition of slavery, but it always had a dark presupposition that we are now beginning to see more clearly. That is the solvency of each individual human being. So, Complicated part over here. In, in its historical trajectory, capital needs to absorb abstract labor, so human energy, in as much quantity as possible. But on the other hand, competition creates an increase in productivity through which labor power becomes superfluous and is replaced by machinery. So this relation between technology and labor power is not direct. So it's not a simple technical material problem of replacing humans with machines, as so often is assumed by automation theory but of a tendentially global contradiction between a necessary ever increasing amount of fixed capital as it is machinery and the limit of its ability to absorb an absolute mass of labor power producing surplus value. So this contradiction has a well-known compensation mechanism which is expressed, expressed, expressed in the capacity of the system as a whole at each increase in productivity to absorb greater amount of absolute of uh, labor power, that is more workers than those that are eliminated through the introduction of new machines. So the problem is that this internal compensation mechanism can only be effective while the speed of innovations in products is greater than the speed of innovation in the production process. So since the start of the third industrial revolution, the relation is inverted. And for the first time, the rationalization and scientification of productive forces make superfluous more labor power than the one that it can absorb. This implies a drastic fall in the production of surplus value, not a new amount of accumulation. So we get to the center of the, the lecture. So abstract labor reveals what has never ceased to be, a, a very violent form of social exclusion where someone who shows himself unable to sell his labor power in the world, uh, in the world market, becomes superfluous and is simply abandoned to his fate. In this sense, precisely in contrast to what happened in the, far, in, in the past phases of, ca of capitalism, we are facing now a violent logic of demobilization of labor power and containment of superfluous populations. 
while the entire planet is entirely dominated by the logic of capital and all continents tightly organized in competing nation states. So surplus population don't have where to go. This objective structure of superfluity helps us understand not only the reason why most cases of modern slavery begin with fictitious job offers, but also why a global apartheid and a global deportation regime started to take shape. Now let's look at three, these three aspects uh, in a little bit more detail. So this is, you know, you don't have to read it all. I think it's very, very clear. So Marx gave an, gave an enormous importance to the problem of surplus populations in the reproduction of capital. The entire chapter of capital dedicated to the general law of capitalist accumulation is actually a long reflection on surplus populations. It's only in relation to capital that this population is superfluous and not in relation to the material production capacity of subsistence goods. So it's not Malthus. Marx calls this surplus population relative surplus population or industrial reserve army. So Marx divided this surplus population in four groups. The floating group, that is workers kept out of production during the periods of stagnation and calls during an economic boom. The latent surplus population is the agricultural workers always in imminent superfluity with the intensification of capital in, agri in agriculture uh, and pushed to migrate to, to, towards the cities. The stagnant is a part of the active labor army, but with, with extremely irregular employment. Within time, and Marx's words, taking a proportionally greater part in the general increase of that working class than the other elements. And finally, the paupers, you know, the lowest sediment, the, the criminals, the dead weight of the Industrial Reserve Army, as he said. So most Marxists focus on floating surplus populations, but they seem to ignore that the moving contradiction of capital implies in the long run a growing stagnant and consolidated surplus population on a world scale. At a given moment, Marx states, the relative mass of the Industrial Reserve Army thus increases with the potential energy of wealth. But the greater this reserve army, the greater is the mass of the consolidated surplus population, whose misery is in inverse ratio to the amount of torture it has to undergo in the form of labor. So whoever sticks outside labor is in worse conditions than the ones that are working. So the more extensive, finally, the Lazarus layers of the working class and the industrial reserve army, the greater the official pauperism. So this is, as Marx, in Marx's words, the absolute general law of capitalist accumulation. So the general law of capitalist accumulation is the law of, on surplus population. So in the long run, we are no longer dealing with a relative surplus population of self-owners who some, at some future moment in time will be called to industrial production. We are dealing with the disposable industrial reserve army put on hold forever an absolute surplus population from the standpoint of capital with an unequal manifestations on, uh, throughout the world. So uh, people are expelled uh, or kept out from the production of capital, but they, but they have to survive under the dictatorship of capital at the same time. So for this reason, uh, for this reason they also do not simply become unemployed and live off the air. So in addition to increasing structural employment, what we have is a rampant underemployment. Accounting to this year's ILO World Employment and Social Outlook report, uh, the mismatch between labor supply and demand extends far beyond 188 million unemployed across the world in 2009. Second, the total labor underutilization is more than twice as high as unemployment, affecting 470 million people worldwide. Around 2 billion workers worldwide are informally employed, accounting for 61% of the global workforce, and over 630 million workers worldwide still live in extreme or moderate poverty. Uh, now, several authors noticed the rise of a general logic of superfluity and disposability. And in fact, the problem appeared right at the beginning of the dominant discourse of modern slavery. After all, Kevin Vale's first and widely quoted book, on the topic was significantly entitled Disposable People. There are, it, there are at least two serious problems with Bale's explanation. First of all, Bale's explanation is Malthusian, relating the growth of modern slavery exclusively to the growth of world population and seeking to derive the price of slaves over the course of 4,000 years from this absurd way. What needs to be shown is the relation with the moving contradiction in the internal history of capital, a much more recent phenomenon. 
In second place, Bale seems to defend the idea that people are disposable as slaves. But at all times, it is obvious in his argument that they are, were already disposable before becoming slaves. That is why Bale so often uses the expression potential slaves, but without recognizing the ambiguity. Even if modern slaves are in fact slaves, as Bales argues, one thing is certain, a potential slave is not a de facto slave. Enslavability presupposes disposability, not the reverse. So the structure of disposability is also so wide that Bales can sometimes says that even some slaveholders today are as disposable as the enslaved. But we do not have to accept, accept Bell's explanations or his concept of modern slavery to recognize that in fact he points to a very serious problem with the global reproduction of capital. But there are two curious things. One is that Bell's stopped evoking the problem of surplus populations and disposability in more recent works. Another is the fact that his thesis on surplus population is never really criticized by its furious critics especially those who focus on neoliberal policies. In fact, they tend to either to ignore the problem completely or to minimize its relevance. So, um, Genevieve Le Baron and Alison Ayers, for example, in an article on new slavery in Africa state, although scholars have described overall labor conditions as either a reserve army of labor or a surplus population to be let die, our analysis suggests that such characterizations may not be sufficiently nuanced to encapsul encapsulate the complex modalities of labor exploitation. So in particular, generalizations regarding surplus populations may overlook the ways in which surplus workers are not in fact epiphenomenal to capital accumulation. Rather, these workers' unfreedom has been fostered by firms and works to anchor accelerated exploitation across the spectrum of labor exploitation. So a detailed analysis of surplus population is certainly necessary. But the question is whether or not surplus population constitutes the frame of reference and the general trend of capitalist dynamics. So for these authors, clearly not. The frame of reference is the neoliberal policies developed by the states. So in another article, Le Baron and Nicolas Phillips claim that states do not themselves cause unfree labor. Rather, through the, pol through the political projects pursued to facilitate globalization and engagement with its, with its very process, they put in place the conditions in which individuals and groups of people become vulnerable to unfree labor. So states are indeed important in managing super, superfluity, but they do not create superfluity. Superfluity results from the moving contradiction of capitalism. However, we cannot fail to notice the term vulnerability being used here. So there is a huge consensus on the term vulnerability uh, being used by researchers with the most diverse standpoints. So the idea is not that only modern slaves are vulnerable, but that vulnerability is key to understand modern slavery. So of course, social vulnerability has a long history, but perhaps this notion is not able to capture exactly what we are currently facing. So the term vulnerability has a military connotation of exposure to an enemy when one, in, in, one is between two safe positions, let's say. It is also associated with risk management, especially natural disasters and more significantly points to something that is only temporarily at risk. Now, superfluity, on the other hand, points to the normal condition of something that has no more duty or reason to exist in a determinate state of things. So if social vulnerability accompanies the historical trajectory of capitalism, I would say that superfluity is the fundamental operative logic in its collapse. So there is no doubt that there seems to be a relation between a global crisis of labor and the phenomenon of modern slavery. These are uh, campaigns, posters on modern slavery. So there is a relation between the impersonal and abstract violence of a shrinking labor market and the very real violence of everyday life of a great part of humanity. But this structural uh, connection doesn't get the intention it deserves. Uh, these graphics appear at the Global Slavery Index of 2016, but they show the mode of entry into trafficking by region of victims of trafficking assisted by the IOM in uh, 117 countries in 2015. Uh, we should notice the numbers that show that in the vast majority of cases, the, mo the mode of entry into trafficking was through the offer of employment or labor migration opportunities. 
it's 90% in three the region. There is not a single reflection or even a comment about this data in the Global Slavery Index, although the report often mentions that the high unemployment rate as a factor of modern slavery. I think that these numbers point to the fundamental contradiction of capitalism and its current logic of superfluity. Now, it's obvious that the fundamental contradiction of capitalism and its logic of superfluity applies to the whole world, but they, they do not manifest themselves with the same intensity and scale in all parts of the planet. So studies on, on contemporary unfree labor in the global south that continue to try to frame these phenomena in the perspectives of neoliberalism or ongoing primitive accumulation, from my point of view, seriously misinterpret what is really happening. It's absolutely correct to account for the increase in the scale of land grabbing, the number of export processing zones, or new forms of job insecurity in recent decades, the agro-business, and so on. But these phenomena have nothing to do with an ongoing primitive accumulation or a new regime of accumulation, and are not explained only by IMF policy options or structural adjustment programs. So populations are not being driven out of the common agricultural land by the, by the millions to be mobilized and exploited as labor power in large scale industrial projects on a national scale with implications in all economic branches. So millions of people are being thrown out and simply turned to their fate, while only a few hundreds are still integrable on the islands of productivity that are the EPCs. So furthermore, most of the, 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 the surplus population has been urban since birth. So they simply seek to survive through informal work from an early age with no prospect of becoming integrated in the formal economy throughout their lives. So this is a logic of demobilization of labor power and this situation I think will not improve. So while the development of what has been called industry 4.0 through the widespread use of industrial robots and the increasing importance of artificial intelligence, I think we enter a new stage of the moving contradiction and the corresponding logic of superfluity of labor power intensifies. So although at different rates, industrial automation is advancing rapidly in both developed and developing uh, countries. So the matrix of comparative advantages, advantages that shaped the last decades will certainly change very soon. For now, low-income countries still have competitive labor costs, but the situation will not continue for much longer. In 2017, for instance, a well-known global brand of sportswear put in operation in the USA a Suebot, a robot capable of making 8,000 t-shirts per day. Uh, if this is a sign that automated industrial production will be installed more intensively in high-income countries, it's called reshoring, then offshore production will tend to decline with serious employment effects in both high and low income countries. But the development of automation in low income countries themselves will have devastating impacts. So the ILO estimates that by 2040, in the Asian five, that is Cambodia, Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, and Vietnam, 55, uh, 56% of, of workers could be expelled from the labor market as a result of industrial automation. Nearly three in five jobs face a high risk of automation. In Vietnam, for example, 70% of jobs may be at risk, which means more than 36 million people. In the garment, textile, and footwear industry, the GTF, which accounts for 59 of industrial employment in Cambodia and 39 of Vietnam, Automation may affect more than 85% of workers in these two countries. But this is not a problem of GTF only. Around 27 million subsistence farmers and low-skilled crop farmer laborers, nearly 23 million street vendors, stall and market salespersons, and almost 5 million low-skilled construction laborers of the Asian five are also in high-risk category of technological substitution. So no wonder that there are already several warnings of the risk of the so-called human trafficking in these countries. Now, this brings me to the last point. So industry 4.0 will certainly intensify uh, existing migratory movements and create new patterns that are still difficult to predict. 
uh, considering what I have said, it's not surprising that the theme of human trafficking, the most mobile form of modern slavery, has gained a leading hold in the international media and political agenda in comparison uh, with other phenomena dubbed modern slavery. Although it is widely recognized that debt bondage in Asia and Latin America is by far the mode of unfree labor with the greatest weight in global numbers. So what matters to me here is the ideological character of the so-called neo-abolitionism. So this graph represents uh, a search of Google Books and Graham for different terms related to modern slavery between 1970 and 2008. So the horizontal axis represents years and the vertical axis, the relative fre frequency of the use of different terms or expressions in the English language database of Google Books that has more than 8 million books. So what is important to emphasize here is the total mastery of the expression human trafficking compared to other terms associated with modern slavery, especially since 2000. So there is a tremendous conceptual confusion surrounding human trafficking. First, sometimes modern slavery and human trafficking seem to be treated almost as equivalent. At other times, slavery appears as a subcategory of trafficking, and in other situations, the exact opposite occurs. Second, according to international legal protocols, human trafficking necessarily involves crossing national borders and does not include internal trafficking. So the legal framework thus appears to be more concerned with state borders than with humanitarian problems. So this concern is particularly clear in the way in which this problem is often associated with the so-called smuggling of migrants. So uh, Kevin Bell's publications, both individual and collective, are particularly problematic in this regard for me. For example, he said, human trafficking is the process of delivering a person into enslavement. It is a process defined by its end result. So if a person is smuggled into the United States and then left free to find a job, the crime is smuggling. If a person is brought here and then held against his or her will and forced to work without pay, the crime is human trafficking, which is to say slavery. So firstly, in following, following international protocols, it is assumed that border crossing is a condition of human trafficking. Second, it is assumed that trafficking is the same as slavery. Third, the trafficking is just smuggling as is of violence and deception. So in other words, to fight smuggling is always to fight potential human trafficking crimes, and according to the conceptual short circuit of Bale's new abolitionism, also to fight slavery. So it's not difficult to see how a logical conclusion with uh, political consequences can be drawn from this argument. So the fight against irregular migration is a condition of the fight against modern slavery. I think this is very, very, very problematic. So what seems increasingly obvious is that the ambiguities of human trafficking discourse provides states with a wide ma margin of maneuver and discretion, and not only do not prevent, but also, brought, uh, but also allow that border security policies to be justified with supposed humanitarian concerns in the context of the composition of the capitalist world system. So when the argument of the crime of smuggling of migrants turns out to be insufficient, as is the case with the current criminalization of the rescue of migrants in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, it is also always possible to invoke the humanitarian argument of combating trafficking or fighting slavery for what is in fact an international migration management program with the purpose of legitimizing tight border control arbitrary arrest and deportation of migrants. So the instrumentalization of anti-slavery arguments for the purposes of political domination and population control is far from historical novelty. At the end of the 19th century, the Berlin Conference, which distributed the territory of the African continent among the various European empires, justified colonization by invoking, among other things, the fight against slavery in Africa a claim that supported King Leopold II of Belgium in his atrocities in his private colony of Congo. So a few years later, Mussolini invaded Ethiopia using the same pretext. But in, in the context of the collapse of the capitalism, the fight against slavery 
argument is not to include populations under imperial rule, but above all to legitimize the exclusion of surplus populations from certain national or supranational territories. So uh, I will end up with a warning sort of way. So the global crisis of capitalism and its con corresponding logic of superfluity will not slow down. I think with the pandemic of coronavirus, it will speed up. So if we are not careful, it is very likely uh, that new abolitionist concerns will increasingly end up flanking or feeding an imperialism of exclusion in barbaric management programs of surplus populations, and especially of the global south. So I, I will end up here. Thank you.